Hello and welcome. My name is Pamela Espelon. I'm an arts writer for MinPost in Minneapolis. And I'm here with Priti Gandhi of the Minnesota Opera, Alex Ross of the New Yorker, and filmmaker Ilan Warshaw. For the next 45 minutes or so, we're gonna be talking about the German composer, Richard Wagner. More than 200 years after his birth, he's still hugely controversial and influential. And one reason for the controversy was his outspoken anti-Semitism. Starting next weekend, Minnesota Opera will stream its 2016 production of Wagner's Das Rheingold as part of its fall 2020 season. Das Rheingold is the first opera in Wagner's epic ring cycle, and it comes with some baggage, mainly Wagner himself. So our theme today is the art versus the artist, Wagner's Das Rheingold. And let's meet our panelists. Priti Gandhi is Vice President Artistic for Minnesota Opera. Before then, she was Artistic Administrator of San Diego Opera. And before then, she was an opera singer with an international career, who I discovered, Priti, made her Paris debut as a Valkyrie. So she knows a little about Wagner from the other side of the stage, and she's committed to advancing diversity in all areas of the art form. Alex Ross has been the New Yorker's music critic since 1996, a MacArthur and Guggenheim fellow. He is the author of three books, including The Rest is Noise, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. His latest book, Wagnerism, Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music, came out in September. The New York Times described it as a work of enormous intellectual range and subtle artistic judgment. Elon Warshaw is a New York-based filmmaker, writer, and educator. He produces independent films and projects for Carnegie Hall, the League of American Orchestras, and Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, where he's working at the moment. His feature-length films include the 2013 documentary Wagner's Jews, which was broadcast on PBS and internationally, and the BBC called it brilliant. So that's our panel for today. And I wanna start by asking Pretty a question that I'm hearing the Minnesota Opera is already getting. Why has Minnesota Opera brought Das Rheingold back at this time? Thank you, Pamela. Um, so as you mentioned, this was a production from 2016 that we produced and um, Producing Wagner in and of itself presents some challenges for many American houses, namely the size of the orchestra. So this was a rather unusual production in that we placed the orchestra on the stage and we created sets and action around the orchestra so that the orchestra would fit on stage and it became this blend of the music and the drama. And in order to uh, capture footage for promotional trailers and whatnot, we had um, cameras without audio capture, capturing different clips and scenes. We happened to catch the entire opera from a multi-camera shoot, but we didn't have the audio capture with it. When the pandemic hit and all the opera companies in America were forced into cancellations, of course, we were now faced with the prospect of wondering how do we continue to produce our art form? How do we continue to offer opera to our audiences, our communities? How do we continue to make work for our creatives and our artists? Um, this is a challenge that continues to evolve as we see currently uh, companies trying to find outdoor productions, virtual productions. Um, in the summer, when we were trying to see what can we do in the fall after we had canceled our season, we realized that we had this captured footage of the 2016 Rheingold, and we decided to find a way to stream it virtually. So what we did was we took the audio capture and we've married it to the visual footage. And then we thought this is a great chance for us to start experimenting with some new technologies. So we decided to create a format in 3D and virtual reality to see how that goes. How is that received? And uh, some would say that uh, Rheingold lends itself perfectly to such a medium. So it's an experiment. It's a way for us to continue to present our art form in this very surreal time of pandemic and cancellations when we cannot physically gather um, in a theater with singers, orchestra members, close proximity 
how do we continue to have a presence with our art form? And that's how this stream of Rheingold came about. People are already getting their 3D glasses and they're pretty excited about them <laughs> in the mail. Alex, please tell us a bit about your new book. Uh, yes. Well, I know it's a big book. <laughs> it is, yeah. Uh, I, have it. I have it right here, not to be uh, too vulgar about it, but, but it is um, a hefty book. Um, and you know, what I tried to do here is to write a book not about Wagner himself, there's thousands of, of books uh, about him already, but about his impact, especially his cultural impact. Um, because something quite remarkable happened uh, toward the end of the 19th century where Wagner did become almost an artistic movement, so Wagnerism. Mm -hmm. uh, he had an enormous um, influence uh, on the arts and, and literature from France, where uh, leading uh, avant-garde uh, uh, writers such as Baudelaire and, and Mallarmé uh, paid attention to Wagner, uh, to uh, uh, the UK and America, George Eliot, uh, Mark Twain, uh, to Germany, of course. Uh, he always had a profound impact in, in Germany uh, and on and on. And so I try to, to sort of follow the stages uh, of this influence as it spread and to show the diversity of it, I think, because um, you know, our given images of Wagner are that he was grandiose, bombastic, the operas are very long. Um, and in terms of his political identity, uh, he is associated so strongly with Nazi Germany. Uh, and is, is sort of, if there's one thing that sort of people in the street know about Wagner, it's that he was Hitler's favorite composer. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was. Uh, but he was also beloved of the civil rights uh, uh, activist uh, and and uh, philosopher W. E. B. Du Bois, uh, Theodor Herzl uh, loved uh, Wagner's music. Uh, you find uh, feminists, uh, uh, early gay rights activists responding to Wagner, uh, and politically, sort of all the way to the very left, uh, a very strong cohort of of leftist uh, Wagnerians. So it's it's a very broad phenomenon. I try to capture the extent of it, but then. Uh, I also want to show why ultimately the Nazis made such a convincing claim on Wagner and how uh, he became uh, ever more uh, uh, ideologically uh, constricted, you know, in terms of his <clears throat> reputation and influence. Uh, and that's a process that, that Wagner himself participated in um, and uh, uh, furnished uh, the grounds uh, for such uh, an appropriation uh, by the Nazis. So it's a, it's a very complex story. And, and I think it's, it's asking people to deal with complexity. Uh, there are no simple answers here. I'm not uh, absolving Wagner, but I'm not demonizing him either. I'm just presenting uh, this, this incredibly difficult case of, of how art lends itself to multiple interpretations um, and its, its meaning is never fixed. And it's hard not to love the music no matter what side you're on because it just picks you up and shakes you and carries you away. So, hmm. Ilan, please tell us about your film, Wagner's Jews. I'm guessing it surprised a lot of people when they saw it, it surprised me. Um. And in some ways it surprised me. Mm -hmm. um, the, the film, um, it's a documentary that I made um, in, in 2013. Um, and the idea, um, I, I, think, I think one thing that I, um, I, I feel that I really uh, uh, very much share about, about Alex's perspective on Wagner is, is, is the notion which she's, I've read and I've heard him say in other contexts of passionate ambivalence. Um, you know that this is a composer who 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 can inspire. You know, very divergent reactions, conflicted reactions, even in the same person. Um, I think I was looking for an artistic venue for a while to to sort of explore my own very conflicted relationship with this composer. Um, you know, as uh, uh, as somebody who. Um, you know, I'm, I come from a musical family. I'm, I'm also Jewish. Um, my, my mother's from Israel, uh, and, and and although there was a a musically very uh, uh, 
it was it was it, it was a musically omnivorous uh, childhood. Um, Wagner was never played in my household. It was, mm. it, was it, it was very much the primary association was was you know this um, close connection with the posthumous reception in Nazi Germany and his anti-Semitism. Um, and uh, uh, actually the first time I heard Wagner's music was when as a teenager I was playing it um, as a violinist and various youth orchestras. And then a few years later, I, I became a, a conducting student and I started conducting these works. Um, so I never had a passive Wagnerism or a passive Wagner experience. The first, literally the first times I heard the music, I was involved in making it. And, and, and you know, th those were very intense um, and challenging experiences for me because I, I found the music electrifying. Um, and yet so much about the man was, uh, um, seemed horrifying to me. Um, and I, I think I was looking for a while for a way to to look at that, um, not in a personal way, but to sort of look at it in you know in terms of Wagner himself. And um, around the time of the bicentennial of Wagner's birth, I, I was uh, um, you know I was able to um, to pitch this film to to Arte to a German network, which commissioned me to make a film about uh, Wagner's. Um, relationships with Jews, close personal and professional relationships that he actually had throughout his uh, career. You know, most people, as, as um, was mentioned, know of him as, uh, well, well as, as Hitler's favorite composer, but maybe uh, one, one level just beneath the surface, you know, that he was a, a vehement anti-Semite, a pronounced anti-Semite. Um, but what people don't realize is that, um, as, as often, is that despite that, um, or in conjunction with that, he was also surrounded for most of his working life by this cadre of, of Jewish supporters um, and assistants, uh, interns sometimes, for lack of a better word. You know, they did a lot of work for him. Sometimes they even lived in his house. Um, one of them was so devoted to Wagner that he killed himself when Wagner died. So these were very close relationships. And uh, I became quite fascinated with this on a psychological level. You know, who were these people? What brought them to Wagner? What brought him to them? What, if anything, does it tell us about his anti-Semitism and about the whole historical, um, you know, tableau that we have there uh, in late 19th century Germany and Europe, and, and the, the the role of the Jewish community um, as they're as they're trying to find their place in in this rapidly changing world. Um, so that 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 was the film. That that was the basis of the film is trying to understand what these relationships were all about. And then we also included some material about the debate over uh, uh, performing Wagner in Israel, um, which is a controversy that you know bookends the film. That was very—it was a very interesting part of it. On the one hand, are the Holocaust survivors who say, "Absolutely not, we're never having him here," and on the other hand, is Suban Mehta saying, "Sure, we are." So it's—it was. Um, I was I was really fascinated that he was so 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 surrounded by Jews, despite how he what he said about them publicly, what he wrote about them. And um, did you, did you um, find what you were looking for when you were making this film? I think I found something else. Um, I, 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 uh, the first thing I, I discovered, I shouldn't say that, it was one of the last things that I discovered about this mystery um, of why he had so many Jews is that, first of all, it wasn't really so much of a, of a mystery. Um, Jews were, highly represented um, in the ranks of music lovers, of musical performers, um, you know, in the publishing side of, of, of music. Um, they were uh, sort of enthusiastic participants in the musical life of certainly Central and Western European countries in a way that you don't see many Jewish people of those generations represented among painters or sculptors. Maybe partly because there is a prohibition in in Judaism against graven images, you know, so you don't there, there isn't as much a a heritage of of the plastic visual arts um, in 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 Jewish life prior to the nineteenth century. But music was always a big part of of Jewish life, and so um, there are many Jews in music, you know, um, and there were at the time. Uh, if you look at Brahms, who was Wagner's sort of rival composer, there were just as many Jewish people surrounding Brahms and in the ranks of his, his champions. So I, I don't think it's, it's that, 
I don't think it's as surprising per se that there were Jews who were Wagnerians. Um, I also feel that the course of this is that actually their Jewishness was a big part of why he chose to draw mm -hmm. them into orbit. Because quite frankly, I think that uh, he, he exploited their insecurities and he exploited the fact that they were perfectly aware of his stature as a leading exponent of anti-Jewishness. And um, if I could boil it down, I think they had more to prove than anybody. Um, and, uh, and, and, and he, he, he played that instrument in the orchestra for all it was worth. Uh, so uh, I, I think there was nothing uh, accidental about the fact that he, you know, that he chose to associate with these Jewish people at the same time reminding them of how allegedly inferior and, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, irreconcilable their people are with the Germans and then asks them for money. Um, and then, um, you know, I mean, he sets the pattern even in his manifesto. <laughs> Judaism and music is most notorious. It's not only about, it's not only written about the Jews, it's written to the Jews. Mm. Because at the end, he, he always puts an asterisk in there where he, he makes the case that some really forward thinking, uh, artistically emancipated Jewish person who recognizes art of true value, read the works of Wagner, can, um, can prove himself the, the valiant exception you know, to, all, to all the evils that have been described. So, so he was very canny about that. I, and meanwhile, I and meanwhile, here's my Venmo. <laughs> meanwhile, here's my PayPal. Even Wagner in the age of social media is. Yeah. Hmm. That's a Twitter account that would have been worth watching. Um, uh, you know, so so I, I don't think this was accidental. I think it was actually quite strategic. Hmm. That's not to say he didn't have genuine liking for these people or they for him. Human beings are complex. You know? You know, we're all capable of compartmentalizing, um, but I, I, I do. I, it gave me a lot of, of insight that I, I feel I didn't have before. Um, and for whatever it's worth, I don't think it, it, it dilutes the, the intensity of his anti-Semitism to know that he had these Jewish associates, all of whom were very useful to him, that he uh, that he kept around. So we have we have two uh, two things. If anybody's watching this, um, if you're looking for something to do, Alex's book is available now, and you can pick it up. And you can find Elon's film. You might take a little bit of looking, but I found I found um, mine in our local library. So, and I'm sure you can still order it. But um, these are these are both uh, projects that were very intense for both of you and there's a lot going on in both of them and uh there you go so therefore you they're for your pleasure awaiting you so um hitler back to wagner and and hitler <laughs> back to wagner and hitler a little bit um wagner died six years before hitler was even born so is it and Alex, if I, if I make horrible mistakes on this, you will immediately jump in and correct me on any of this stuff. But is it reasonable to judge Wagner based on how Hitler felt about him? Because I think a lot of people do that. They go, well, Hitler loved him, so therefore he must be bad. Is it, is it, is it reasonable to do that or to blame Wagner for the, for the rise of Nazi Germany? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> well, if we, if we really, are going to take Nazism seriously and the sort of study of the origins of Nazism seriously, and of course we should, uh, we can't have a simple answer. And, and as to, to, to blame Wagner, of course, uh, solely for, for the rise of this movement is absurd. Um, I think um, even to, to assign him a, a very leading role in, in the uh, political emergence of, of Nazism is, is not really a, an accurate picture of the complexity of all the forces uh, that, that, that fed into Nazism. Wagner was certainly a part of it, uh, but I don't necessarily think he was, he was uh, a really uh, dominant um, force uh, politically, certainly in terms of anti-Semitism. Uh, he helped to popularize uh, a 
a noxious form of anti-Semitism. I mean, every form of anti-Semitism is noxious, but, but what Wagner did in the Jewishness and Music pamphlet and then in writings at the end of his life was to move toward uh, a, a pseudo-scientific, pseudo-biological definition of race uh, and of Jews as uh, somehow genetically different from so-called Aryans uh, from, uh, from other people. Um, I don't think he actually went all the way uh, toward uh, that kind of definition, but, but he was tending in that direction. Um, and, and he helped to popularize that way of thought simply because he was such an enormously famous figure, uh, especially in Germany. He was becoming absolutely lionized uh, at the end of his life in, in German culture. So he played a, a dangerous, uh, notable role in that respect. Um, but anti-Semitism, of course, was found all across the political spectrum from left to right. Um, in terms of other aspects of Nazism as a political ideology, uh, I think um, Wagner's influence was much less significant um, because uh, Wagner's politics, to the extent that we can really get a coherent picture of what of Wagner's politics were, were, were sort of rather chaotic and, and contradictory, and there were elements in him uh, uh, that were sort of in the direction of, of socialism or, or anarch anarchism. He was quite ambivalent about the, um, the, the desirability of, of having a, a strictly organized, centralized state. Uh, and actually, toward the end of his life, he was complaining vociferously about, about the uh, militarized uh, German state, uh, imperial uh, Germany. And, and so you can see also a kind of pacifist uh, streak in Wagner that does go along with, with this incredibly belligerent nationalist rhetoric at the same time. So it's quite complicated, mm -hmm. um, but it's just, it's not an absolutely straight, simple line, I think from, from Wagner uh, to Nazism because, um, you know, his, his opposition to the idea of a, of a state having a standing army, you know, is, is quite contradictory to, to sort of the uh, fundamental nature of a totalitarian state. Uh, so, you know, when the Nazis appropriated Wagner, they had to clean him up somewhat. Um, they had to omit uh, elements of the picture. Um, and, you know, even his um, anti-Semitism, I mean, one curious thing that you find about Hitler and Wagner, uh, is that he never uh, directly alluded to Wagner's uh, anti-Semitism. Other Nazis did, uh, but Hitler did not. And I think that's in part because there was something um, uh, sort of uh, chaotic uh, and eccentric uh, about Wagner's uh, rhetoric, and it wasn't easily reduced uh, to propaganda. Um, and I think there's also the fact that, that in terms of Hitler's relationship with Wagner, uh, he fell in love with the music as a very young man, as a teenager, at a time when his politics were, were completely unformed. We have very little idea of what, what um, his polit political beliefs were uh, at that stage of his life. Uh, and the anti-Semitism only becomes visible actually after uh, the First World War, um, uh, when uh, Hitler is about 30. Um, and so we can't see some sort of immediate radicalization uh, of Hitler uh, by his, his early exposure to, to Wagner. Uh, that happens later. Wagner undoubtedly played a role in it. Hitler certainly knew Wagner's anti-Semitic writings, um, but there, there, is, there are other forces at work. This is sort of simply what I would say. Um, and, and so I just want to be, I think it's very important to be you know, absolutely clear um, and precise uh, about these uh, relationships, and not to not to simplify it, um, and um, you know, just 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 to uh, I think to to sign too much responsibility um, to Wagner uh, distorts the the uh, all the other sources, omits all the other sources of anti-Semitism and of Nazi ideology. And it sort of lets everyone else off the hook. I mean, you know, Wagner did not invent anti-Semitism and nothing that he wrote about the Jews was as violent as what Martin Luther wrote about the Jews. Uh, and so of course, anti-Semitism goes much, much deeper in German culture, in Western culture. Um, and, and so that's the kind of, the, the sort of picture that, I, that I'm seeking when I 
contemplate this relationship, which is nonetheless a real relationship and one that no person who loves Wagner's music should excuse or ignore. Thank you. Pretty. What do you say to Minnesota Orchestra, uh, Opera, sorry, patrons today who say, why are you doing Das Ryan Gold when, when Wagner was such an anti-Semite? I mean, you're probably getting questions like those or, or some kind of response to doing this particular opera at this particular time, because one, one thing that's happened is, is things have heated up pretty considerably in the past few years. Since your film, Ilan, we've had the Me Too movement starting in 2017, and then we've had cancel culture popping up and, and people saying you can't produce this and, and marching with signs outside of Miss Saigon. I mean, that was happening too. And then, and then the, the, again, the, the um, killing of George Floyd and the racial reckoning that that's coming up, but people have short fuses and, and they don't want, they want things to be simple, Alex, your simple line. They want there to be a simple line and they want to say, I'm sorry, you may be doing this now, but 20 years ago you did that and therefore you're unacceptable to me and I think we should erase your work. I mean, there's a, there's a, we all have heard a lot about that. So, mm -hmm. so that puts you and the Minnesota Opera in a, in a position. And what, what, is, what is your response to people? Well, that is the question we're all asking ourselves now, isn't it? Especially here in Minneapolis since the George Floyd murder where mm -hmm. so much of that, that focus, we are so, we are, are intensely focused on that question right now, looking at our own responsibility as an arts company as well. Um, I think that, that Ilan and Alex have already uh, mentioned quite well that human beings are complex creatures and none of this is easy. Cancel culture is easy. Does that mean that that is the right path to walk? Not necessarily because how much of our art form can teach us, what our art form can teach us so much about our own history. I think in opera, we, we have what we call the inherited repertoire which is what we call the traditional canon, the classic canon. And as, as many people know, Minnesota Opera has uh, also been very focused on creating new works to add to that canon so that we start to talk about new stories. And I think the question of why would we produce Wagner right now when he was an anti-Semite, that question needs to be broadened to a whole other host of questions with the inherited repertoire. There are so many companies right now that do not want to touch Madame Butterfly for its racist tropes, it's, it's complicated narrative and story. Uh, the same, the same uh, concerns apply to Turandot. How do we produce Turandot in today's day and age with our, with our perspective? And so I think the answer to that is not, um, it's not a cut and dry answer and I believe it's an evolving answer. And I, I don't think, we're, we're not always gonna get it right, but we're gonna do our best to continue to answer the question. So I think for now, what I would say is that we do our best to present it in context that we have conversations like this one. Do we choose to only showcase art from people that we deem morally 100% upstanding of where we are now in our own perspective and what we like to call progress? Um, although looking at today's political climate, would we say that we have progressed? I don't know, that's also a very good question. Um, or do we recognize that in the spectrum of behaviors in humanity, some of those very problematic people also created great art? And do we cancel culture that? I think that's also a personal choice as well. Um, or do we talk about the art, how it does come from someone who is a problematic figure and acknowledge the reality of our flawed humanity and our own art making process? Mm -hmm. Is there healing to be done from that process as well? Can we celebrate great art and the process as showing us where they were in the evolution, how it compares to where our lenses are now and be clear that it's all a process of learning and growing. It, obviously none of it is perfect, and like I said, we will make mistakes, but I think that presenting the art should happen regardless as long as we continue to talk about it like we are now. I think it has so much to teach us about how far we still have to go. I like to tell people that we were looking at art that was created a couple hundred years ago and we are shaking our heads in horror about their perspective of who they were. In 100, 200 years, will they be doing the same thing about the art that we create now? Do we want them to cancel culture, our art form, or do we want them to say, Let's look at what they created and let's, let's see what it taught us about who they were then in the opera making art form and how far we have come now and how far do we still have to go. 
that's a very complicated answer to what <laughs> I think is a very complicated question. It's a very complicated question. And as you were talking about the problematic operas, I think um, um, the Minnesota Opera went before the pandemic, its original plans were to produce Don Giovanni this year. Right. And we would have been having this question about Don Giovanni, I'm sure. Especially because in the Me Too days, right? In the Me Too yeah. movement, it creates that's a whole right. new, a whole new narrative around Giovanni and the questions that we want to answer. You're, yeah, you were probably you probably all were ready with all kinds of wonderful answers about Don Giovanni, and now here. Well, it happens to musically. Right. It's one of my favorite operas, so I love talking about it. So Who doesn't amazing. love it. Well, yeah, I think I, I you know, as, as I've, I've read that opera, the, that the canon seems sort of frozen in time, while meanwhile we're evolving, where certain words really aggravate people. There are certain actions on stage make them so angry that they can't see the, the rest of the music. So I guess, you know, our, our theme today loosely is, you know, art versus artist. And I guess, can you love the, is it okay to love the art and hate the artist? And um, that's a, you know, what do we do with that? Absolutely. Again, I think that's also a very personal question. And, and we as a company have a responsibility, I think, to present all the facets of that question and again, create conversations like this one. Um, I can find Wagner's music beautiful and powerful. I've even sung his music, as you've mentioned, without admiring the man's values. But then I, do, I understand it doesn't mean that we want everyone to agree with us and our decision to present it. What we want to do is talk about it. We want to engage people because then that will draw people into our art form and we hope create more love of this very complicated art form. So how do we yeah. separate, how do we separate, I'm sorry, excuse me, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, just when we contemplate the past, when we contemplate the canon, um, we, we see troubling uh, tendencies and, and troubling ideas everywhere. Um, and I think it's sort of very important to keep in mind, you know, so much of the, the conversation that has gone on in recent months and in recent years has been about systemic racism, uh, systemic misogyny. Uh, and what that means is it doesn't come down to uh, single personalities um, and, and somehow, in, you know, separating, separating out the, the good, the virtuous personalities uh, from, from the bad ones. Uh, you know, I think that leads us to the kind of thinking uh, where it's sort of, if we just get rid of you know, a few bad apples, you know, then, then everything will be okay. Mm. Uh, you know, that is not the answer. Uh, thinking systemically means that, that we look at sort of the entire society and the entire cultural context of figures uh, including Mozart, you know, including Johann Sebastian Bach, uh, because uh, you could find an anti-Semitism in the texts of, of Bach's passions uh, and cantatas. Uh, you can find racism in uh, the magic flute. Uh, there is racism in the magic flute. It's not a question of looking for it. Um, and you, you mentioned uh, Puccini um, and, and all these other composers. So it is, it is very widespread. And I think you are hard put to find a major figure in, in musical history who is unblemished uh, by these, th these issues. Um, and so what do we do with that? I mean, of course, the extreme option is to jettison the entirety of the past. Um, and, and that's not uh, an option. Um, uh, and I think it's actually uh, dangerous to, 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 to simply look away from the past and, and, uh, and uh, ignore it. We need to uh, confront it and, and learn from it. Uh, so the other way is to engage in just the kind of process uh, that, that we're doing here, um, to confront the issues, um, to talk about them, to put them in, in context, and to open up a conversation which will sometimes be uncomfortable and, and will arouse uh, strong feelings, even to the point of, of protests um, and, and, uh, and people feeling uh, uh, deeply alienated uh, from our institutions. Uh, but the conversation must go on instead of can't be covered up. And so, you know, with the thing about Wagner, which is so interesting, is that this conversation has been going on for so long. Very it's not an issue time. that has suddenly arisen, you know, in the past few months, along with everything else. You know, people have been asking themselves, they've been asking in public, um, is Wagner too abhorrent 
to be performed, to be listened to, uh, since really the early middle 1850s, <laughs> you know, which is when um, his authorship of the pamphlet Jewishness and Music uh, began to become known. It was initially published uh, anonymously. Um, and so it's been this very, very long term confrontation with Wagner. And what has emerged from that, actually, I think are some, some very constructive ways to engage these questions, not just in terms of talking about it, but in terms of how we perform Wagner, in terms of how we direct Wagner on stage, especially if you look at European productions of Wagner since the Second World War, you know, very often the anti-Semitism is placed on stage. Uh, the the proto-fascist uh, uh, notion of Wagner is placed on stage. And, and, and I think this is is very healthy. It's sometimes messy, and some of these productions are are are, are sort, of, sort of unduly confrontational, perhaps, in their approach. Um, but the, the the sense is that is that you know Wagner is still in flux, and, and people are still tussling over him and, and and debating him, as they have been doing, you know, for for 150 years or more. Elon, I feel like you're itching to say something. Oh, um, well, you know, I, 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 I don't know that it is possible, you know, to cancel Wagner. I mean, I, I think we might as well just start with the obvious, which is it isn't going to happen. Um, I mean, I think he, he has and he deserves a place in, in the operatic canon because he did do so much to, to I mean, I mean the, the, the works have and have had such impact. Um, even in Israel, where you know there's an unofficial, you know, taboo against the major organizations performing his music in public, uh, Wagner is not uh, canceled. You can buy, you know, performances, CDs, videos anywhere in Israel, um, and um, there's actually a lot of enthusiasm for his work in Israel. Um, so, I. What, you know, as, as, as you were talking about, you know, cancel culture, it actually put me in mind of, of, of something that, that Alex said about um, the dangers of blaming Wagner too heavily for Nazi Germany, which is, in a sense, if you, if you make Wagner the primary or a primary um, instigator of Nazism. A villain. Mm -hmm. You make Hitler and Nazism and anti-Semitism someone else's problem. Hmm. You, you other it. And I think that is a big problem, potential problem with some of the manifestations of, of, of cancel culture that, uh, that we're seeing, especially with the past. Um, you know, it, it reminds me sometimes of stories of other societies and regimes in the past that have thought, if we just do away with a few key figures, either, either physically do away with them or just consign them to... Mm -hmm. Right. The, the, the don't touch list, then that just shows how virtuous we are. And I don't think history has, has looked kindly on some of those regimes. Um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, there's nothing in Wagner's operas that, that rises to the level of explicit anti-Semitism that say you would find in Richard Strauss's Salome, where you actually have characters who are called Jews on stage, you know, um, you know uh, murderously bickering and, and whatnot. Um, it may well be latent in his operas. I, pr I think it is. Um, but what do we gain if, if, if we say we don't, we don't, we don't engage with this anymore? What do we gain? Uh, we, 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 we certainly lose something, but what do we gain? I'm not sure we gain anything. I think the past is messy, and, um, but the present is also messy. By erasing the problem or the work, by erasing the work of the person's work, you're not erasing the problem, which is the conversation that we've been, that's been in here about systemic the issues. Evidence of the problem, that's all. I beg your pardon? Just erasing the evidence of the problem. Evidence. But that, you know, but, but what you said, Alex, in your book about that lets, lets them off the hook, you know, it's like, it's like, this is such a, these are bigger problems than one artist's work represents. Which doesn't mean, you know, but of course we, we, we still need to talk about Wagner. I mean, I, I would actually sort of speak up in defense of cancel culture insofar as it means, you know, not literally attempting to, to wipe a major figure like 
Wagner off the map, which is simply not possible. Um, but in terms of, uh, it, you know, it's a confrontational uh, kind of vocabulary that we see, but it's also necessary. I mean, I think it's absolutely necessary uh, that these, these um, issues uh, have been pushed to the foreground, um, uh, uh, especially in, in, in recent months. You know, we, 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 some, you know, there just needs to be this pressure and sometimes the pressure can be, can be harsh. Um, but, uh, but I think it's just, just all to the good, you know, conversation, debate, argument um, is, is all to the good. Um, I just feel that, you know, with, with Wagner, Wagner is just such a slippery figure actually. Um, and sort of, you know, the moment you say something very definite uh, about him, what the work might mean, uh, you can sort of very easily sort of um, uh, uh, assemble evidence uh, showing the precise opposite, you know. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he's just a, just a very multifarious figure in that way. And something that very, very much interested me as I worked on the book was um, talking about Wagner and race not in terms of uh, uh, Jews, but in terms of black people, uh, in terms of African-Americans. And here we find something quite interesting uh, that uh, not just W.E.B. Du Bois, as I mentioned, but a number of other African-American intellectuals, uh, uh, Alan Locke, uh, Shirley Graham, uh, Langston Hughes, uh, Ralph Ellison, uh, were attracted to Wagner's music uh, to some degree or another, and none of them quite as strongly as Du Bois, who, who was a real fanatic. Um, and he went to Bayreuth in 1936, wow. which is a really kind of stunning thing to, to contemplate. Wow, that's an amazing yeah, time. That's story of like, itself. Like the Olympics. Yeah. Um, but the, the point is that this, these, these figures, you know, they, they were aware of, of Wagner's anti-Semitism uh, and his racism, but you know, nonetheless, they, they found Wagner inspiring. Uh, and what was specifically inspiring about Wagner was this idea of, of using your own traditions, legends, and myths as a kind of fund of material for contemporary art and sort of, sort of making a modernizing myth and, and giving it this kind of uh, political edge in terms of the, the, the formation of the identity of a group. Uh, and so that was what Du Bois envisioned uh, as he listened to Wagner was a heroic, uh, Black uh, uh, artwork uh, on the scale of Wagner's Ring, uh, but you know, steeped in African uh, traditions, say. Um, and the other kind of complexity here is that actually, Wagner was absolutely an anti-Semite in terms of his feelings about black people. There's there's much less evidence. Um, it was simply not a great concern of his. Um, you know, there's there's. The white supremacy is is sort of more or less explicit in, in the late writings, uh, but at the same time, Wagner had sympathetic feelings about black people, as he voiced in <clears throat> remarks to his uh, wife Cosima Wagner, recorded in the diaries. He was against slavery. He he favored the Union side in the Civil War. Uh, um, he. Uh, 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 spoke approvingly of uh, the. Uh, uh, Zulu ruler Ketchwayo uh, at a certain point. And this is, you know, this these are just sort of passing remarks. They don't really mean a great deal uh, in the end. But but I think especially Du Bois was was to some degree aware of that that side of Wagner and was aware that he was interested, for example, in the the great black actor Ira Aldrich. Um, uh, who toured Europe widely in the in the 1850s and onward? So this is all, you know. It's just there's this uh, when you when you really dig into it, and just when you dig into the sort of fundamental question of like how did different people respond to Wagner, and what did they take from him? You know, you realize that no matter what Wagner himself said or felt, uh, spectators can remake the work uh, in their own image. Spectators have the power to resist the the seeming. Uh, uh, significance, intended significance of the work, and pull it in some <clears throat> very different direction, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's a, a relationship of of Wagner actually this the seemingly so overpowering figure being overpowered by his spectators um, and and taken in unexpected directions. That's that's a fascinating relationship, and I think it's fundamental to how we how we always relate to art. Um, we always, we always use it to our own purposes. I wanted to cut back with um, Preeti for a minute. And after, especially after, after George Floyd, but 
long before as well, arts organizations have been issuing statements of what matters to them and what their purpose is and the kinds of, especially recently, the kinds of changes they're going to be making. And, and um, I've, got a, I've got a mailbox full of those from arts organizations in, in the Twin Cities in particular. And I, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, should organizations, should, should artists and their work reflect the values of the organizations that present them? Should organizations like Minnesota Opera look around more closely for works that represent their values? Should, is, this even a, is this a question we should even be asking? It's a very good question. Um, and again, since the George Floyd murder earlier this year, we're all asking ourselves that question with much more intensity now about what is our responsibility to our community and how do we create more inclusion and conversation that will help heal our community, especially heal our community from the riots and protests that we saw mm. this summer. Um, I, I think, again, it's not an easy answer. It's a complicated answer because um, is do we do we then research the personal lives of every composer from the past that we decide to produce? And if we, find, and if we find something that we don't agree with their behavior, a composer had a mistress, a composer uh, robbed people, do we then decide that we can't, we can't ever produce their our art? I think it's a much more complicated question than that, as Alex was saying about spectators taking the significance and owning the significance of an art form. I think we as companies also have uh, a responsibility to take the art form and take ownership of how we want to tell that story. Again, presenting it in context of history, but then saying, we want to take ownership of this story and this great music and tell it in a fashion which has something of meaning for us today. Um, again, that's an evolving answer and I don't think we're always gonna get it right. But I do think that we will continue to ask that, that very question um, in terms of adding new works to the repertoire. We continue to look for new stories and um, diverse creative teams, mm -hmm. um, diverse casting. Um, how does uh, a diverse female librettist, how differently do they tell a story than a white male librettist? Uh, the same for composers and directors. For singers, what are we all going to bring from our personal experiences to the stories we tell? And I think that's going to continue to add to this evolving answer. It'll be interesting to see in, in coming years. You can't obviously just decide to have a program and announce a program and perform the program. It's you're gonna have to prepare people, prepare audiences for the program and, and provide more context for the program and more opportunities for community response and discussion, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, producing operas. That's a lot of work all by itself. It is a lot of work, but it's it's yeah. wonderful that we're creating more conversation because it's all about engaging, right? Mm -hmm. And what will we learn from our community about what they want to hear and how they want to be reflected uh, from what we produce? And you're continuing that uh, Minnesota Opera has had a new works initiative for how many, is it 20 years? I believe since 2008 was informally started with the Grapes okay. of Wrath. Okay. So you are you are actively producing and 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 seeking new works and funding new works and financing new works and and um, that's continuing. Is it continuing? Yes, it is continuing. Uh, pandemic has obviously pushed a lot of plans uh, back while we all right. grapple with the question of how to produce right now. But we do have some new works in the in the hopper for the the next five seven years, and we are actively looking at the questions of diversity and new stories and how to add to our inherited repertoire in a way which, which makes it more fulfilling and shows more sides of that life and new sides of the art form itself. Kao Kalia Yang's work has been pushed ahead a couple of years now. Has yeah, it? we're, we're looking at the timeline for the song Poet Correct to, to see how we can produce it in the coming years. This is a, um, uh, Alex and Elon, this is a young Hmong woman writer. Minneapolis and St. Paul has the largest Hmong community in the United States. So, um, and, and uh, Minnesota Opera will be producing a book that she wrote about her father as an opera. So this is very important because, you know, part of the particular problem that classical music has is you know, this extraordinary dominance of figures of the past um, on the performing schedules of our orchestras, opera houses, and, and so on. Um, you know, and there, there have been entire seasons uh, 
where sort of you no know, contemporary That's work right. uh, has has uh, appeared, especially with opera. Um, and what this means is that the, the art form comes to be defined, you know, entirely by the identities of the composers of the past and the preoccupations of the composers of the past. Uh, and these are almost exclusively uh, white male figures. Uh, and you can find women, you can find people of color, um, but there were so few opportunities uh, available uh, to composers in the past um, uh, from those groups um, that, that is just, is just difficult work. Uh, to create that kind of balance, um, uh, it is it is much easier to simply commission new works from composers who represent you know the entire diversity uh, of our society. And and so the more new work uh, you commission, uh, the fewer problems of this kind uh, you are going to have, especially if uh, you are you are choosing composers who who represent uh, what our society looks like. Um, and, and so it's not the answer, um, but, but the, the, the problem subsides uh, somewhat simply if you pay more attention to new music. And this, this is you know, something that you know, Wagner himself uh, always insisted on. Wagner actually uh, disliked the preoccupation with the past and sort of the emerging mentality of quote unquote classical music in the mid 19th century. Um, and he said at the end of his life, he, he assumed that he himself would fade from view uh, mm -hmm. and would be mostly uh, forgotten. For him, uh, uh, music was contemporary music, uh, was was new music, um, and and so uh, you know that's 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 what we need. Always more and more emphasis on on new music. Well, and then of course there's a whole issue, which is a completely different discussion of people who don't like new music. They only want to hear the canon. So it's um it's tough being an opera these days. So, um, final thoughts, anything you want to say to each other, anything, any conclusions, any surprises? Um, this is, uh, this has been absolutely thrilling for me to be able to talk to you all. And, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. But if you want to wrap do you, what closing words, anybody have anything to say? I think I'd like to just say that, um, we're all, we're, it's going to be a, a process and an evolving conversation between creatives, audiences, companies. And um, we won't always get it right, but we will always uh, do our very best to remain authentic and open to new answers. And I think the Minnesota Opera has had a reputation for a while of, of being kind of on a leading edge with the New Works Initiative, which with, with its efforts to diversity and inclusion. And it'll be exciting to see what happens in the next, in the next several years. Thank you. Alex, Elon, oh, Alex? I would add simply, you know, well, what, is, what is this opera about? What is Das Rheingold about? Oh yes. Um, it's, it's about power. It's mm -hmm. about the greed, the lust for power. And, and the destructiveness of the lust for power um, and, and the need for love uh, as a countervailing force. It's about the, the robbing of the gold from the Rhine. Uh, it's about deceit um, and thievery, um, most importantly on the part of the chief of the gods. Uh, and it ends with this false spectacle of the gods marching into Valhalla, this glorious sounding bombastic music, but it's ironic. Uh, because they are marching to their doom, as Loga, the god of fire, is pointing out. Um, and the ride maidens are down below saying, like, all of this is false. Everything up, up above is false. Uh, what's, what's trusty and true is in the depths. Um, and that is, that is a powerful message. That is a, a political message. Uh, the nature of the ring. Uh, the lord of the ring as the slave of the ring. Uh, uh, power enslaves uh, 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 those who hold it and, and eventually destroys uh, those uh, who hold it. These are, these are to say the least, uh, uh, timely messages. Mm -hmm. Timely messages and they're profound and, 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 and thrilling. And at the same time as he was sketching that scenario, Wagner was also detailing in his other writings that that scenario did also have an anti Jewish dimension, which I guess is that troubling dichotomy about him. Um, I think that, I don't know if we can separate art from the views of the artist, I, probably we can't, but I think it's a separate question to ask, can we separate our reception of art 
from the views of the artist or from mm -hmm. the flaws mm -hmm. of the artist or the flaws of the past. And there, I think the answer is resoundingly yes. And I think Alex's brilliant book, in which he encyclopedically shows how many different kinds of Wagner rights, you know, different kinds and different levels of Wagnerism, you know, Herzl's enchantment with Wagner's music is not the same as, as Hitler's immersion in his ideology. Um, but we can take what we want from these people. Um, even a narcissist like Wagner can't control that. And maybe that's one of the nicest things about, about having history at our fingertips in, in, in this kind of art that we're all celebrating. That also requires us to do some work. I mean, it's the easy way out to find something we don't like about somebody and dismiss everything about them. But yeah. it, it requires, requires us to do some work and willingness to do that work. So. I have been asked to thank our sponsor, the Ricard Wagner Society of the Upper Midwest. To learn more about them, visit wagnertc.org. And uh, meanwhile, Alex's wonderful book, Wagnerism, Elon's wonderful film, Wagner's Jews. Pretty, thank you so much for everything. This has been a real pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.